So thanks for joining us at the shop today. Uh, we were chatting, and, and frankly, I've done this so darn long that most of this stuff is kind of second nature to me. The question came up about how some of the basic functions of the car work, like how you start the darn thing, and even some of the controls in the cockpit, how that works. So uh, we were talking about that and thought, you know, the best thing to do is just show you how it works. The car is not self-starting. To put the starter on, the battery on that it would take to, to start this thing would waste a doggone much. We don't want to have to pack that weight down the track. So all the cars have removable starters, and I'll show you here. Uh, that's the starter that we use, and that is uh, made by RCD, a uh, company out of California. But that starter is an old uh, World War II aircraft starter. Uh, but the, the catch is, in any of this stuff, in any part of the car, you can't have just one. you got to have redundancy. So we go up to the starting line then with two of these battery packs, two starters and two sets of cables because if it has a failure for any reason if a solenoid fails if a cable is not connected right whatever if the battery's dead you don't have time to figure it out and diagnose so if we have a failure of any kind i yank the starter off and somebody already knows it by then they're handing me the other one and taking the bad one we'll diagnose it later so the starter goes down here and in this purple plate there are keyholes in it that allow the, the, the starter to go in. Get it the there it is. Just like that. Then on the back, this knob is going to send the starter jaw out to meet the opposing one on the car. And that will tighten up here in just a moment there. Now we're turning the crankshaft too. So now they're connected. So now that the starter's on, then we're going to take the cable from the battery pack, connect it as well. So now we're hot. So we've got battery, starter, and cable all together. By the way, um, here, here's the way th that this starts. There's no official car key like you get with your, your Pontiac or Dodge or whatever you might have. So this is what we call our car key is right here. This is simply a, a ground that grounds out these coils because of, of this. Uh, it's actually an aluminum welding rod right here that grounds that out to the chassis. So I would spin the motor over and I would nod my head when it's time and then my crew guy would take that and he would pull it out of this hole and that now no longer shorts the coils out and now the motor's hot. So we've spun it over with fuel. When I'm ready, give the nod, they pull this and now we've got ignition and it should light. That's the theory anyway and generally it works pretty well. This is a dribbler tank. We do not start the car on nitro. We start it on methanol or alcohol. So this bottle then would hold a gallon and a half or so of alcohol. And this is gonna to connect to the back of the motor then. So the dribbler bottle is gonna connect right here to this air quick disconnect. So I can put it in and out quickly. And that is going to then put uh, methanol alcohol down through these lines and into each of the cylinders. Then I would turn this lever down at just past the 45 which gets the alcohol flowing into the motor and then we're going to come back up to the starter so we turn it over and what we're looking for is that alcohol to start coming out the pipes it'll mist out the pipes and that way i know we've got fuel it's made it all the way through when i see that and then i give the nod and my crew guy will pull that key out that we showed you and it should start now we're running on alcohol why do we do that we need to get a little heat in the motor before we flip it over to nitro so I will watch this, I'll make sure I have oil pressure, that the motor's not leaking or doing anything stupid, and if everything's working okay, and I've got little heat in the cylinder heads, I felt the cylinder heads here, know that we're doing well, then I'm gonna reach up and give the nod to the driver so that he can see. So I would be here, and of course the cowl would be on, but I'd give the nod like that, and Russ would then know it's time to turn the fuel on. These are the fuel levers, so all the way forward is off, all the way back is what we call high side, which simply means all the pump, all the fuel is going to the motor. So when we start it and I give him the signal, he's not gonna go all the way back. He's gonna snap it back quickly to about halfway or so. And if the windshield were on, you could see there's a particular nut and bolt that holds the windshield on that this kind of lines up with and that's kind of your reference point to where to go. From there, what he's doing though, is he's watching the dash. So there's our digital dash. That right there is our fuel temperature. We can only be 40 degrees or higher. We can't be 39.9. So this is gonna show the RPM of the motor as it's running. And then he's got fuel pressure both here. By the way, since we've got fuel pressure on the digital gauge, why did we keep this old school manual gauge? 
Well, I actually stole that idea from another racer who did the same thing. And the thought is, if you ever lost the electronics, for whatever reason, if it wasn't working, you can still run the car as long as you have that. If you don't have that, you don't know where you're at with adjusting the fuel because you do it based on pressure. So when we start the car, we're gonna flip it back and it can have 100 pounds of pressure or so, um, and then trim it out. Trim it out means to, to reduce the amount of fuel so that you're not putting too much in uh, because that fuel's so cold, it'll actually pull the heat out of the motor. So we wanna run it lean, but enough to keep it running and we kind of have an idea where that is. Okay, so the car's running on fuel. I've get, then taken the starter off the car, given it to my crew guy. He's put it in the back of the Denali. The bottles come off by then, the dribbler bottles come off, and the car's running on its own now. Once I verify that I've got oil pressure, then, then I'm done and I, I come up and I point to this, it's just kind of our routine, and I run on up to uh, show Russ where I want him to start to do the burnout. So um, we've rolled forward to do the burnout. In fact, we should probably go through that, so how we do that. So I've walked on by, went for Russ in here, given him the signals time to roll forward. So he's gonna gently let out on the clutch with no throttle, and the car will just start rolling because of the centrifugal clutch. The clutch is designed so that at idle speed, a couple thousand RPM, it's, it will generate just enough plate load. It's all based on RPM. The faster it spins, the more plate load it generates. So at idle, it generates just enough to move the car forward, but not a lot. And we'll get to that in a minute when we stage the car. But for the burnout, now he's rolling forward. He rolls through the water box and, and he's, he was on the low side and now he's given it just a little bit more fuel for, to do the burnout. We need. You have to match the volume of fuel going into the motor with the load on the motor at that time. So when we're idling, we have no load, we use minimal fuel. So when it's time to do the burnout then, um, he's going to, the driver's gonna then give it a little more fuel because we have some load. We don't have a lot of load, uh, but, but we are having to wing the rear end and the rear tires, but we're spinning it. So there's not a lot of load. You could not, you would not want to high side it and give it all the fuel. It's too much fuel without enough load to burn it. And you can actually physically push the heads off the car. So we're on the, on the burnout setting and he lets the clutch out, starts rolling through. So now the question is, what's the water box? When I was a kid, they used to call it the bleach box because back hundred years ago in the fifties and sixties, they actually used bleach. They were trying to soften up the, the tread of the tire to get it to bite better. But the tires we have today are so incredible. So when you do the burnout, having rolled through this water box, which is where they take this hose, and it's just a concrete pad that I don't know what it is, 10 feet wide or something, and they just wet it down real well, so it's full of water. You roll the car through that, now the rear tires are wet, making it super easy to break them loose. You do not want it to be hard to break them loose. Why? Because it would put heat in the clutch, and that's an enemy of getting these things to run consistent. So now we're gonna do the burnout. Well, we're gonna show you what that looks like down here on the throttle, because it's pretty amazing. Right now, the driver does not have full control of that throttle. Why? There's a throttle stop back there that limits the travel of the throttle pedal. It takes less than an eighth of an inch of throttle blade opening to do that kind of burnout. It just doesn't take much. So now the driver has hit the throttle, but he's only come up against that throttle stop of an eighth inch and the car jumps up on the rear tire and the motor revs up and you're gonna go 1,001, 1,002 off. And there's a school of thought to this too. There are some of the, some of the classes that like to do these long burnouts, but there's a reason we don't do it. If you're racing, you're not there for a burnout competition. You're there to turn the stinking wind light on. They don't pay you extra for a bitchin' burnout. I wish they would, but they don't. So the point is, if you do a long burnout, you do a half-track burnout, by the time you back up, you've lost most of the heat in the tire, but you've heated up the air in the tire. So now your tire pressure is no longer what you thought it was. So 1,001, 1,002, off the throttle. The, the tires are still spinning at crumb, close to 300 mile an hour wheel speed. Clutch goes in, and now you give it brake to stop the car. So we stop the car, and now we gotta put it in reverse. The car's not moving now. So when it's in forward, the, this reverser lever's all the way back towards me. And now we're gonna put it in reverse, and we push that lever forward, let off on the brake, no throttle, and we gently let off on that clutch to get it rolling. At some point, you're gonna come back past Robbie, my bride, and she's gonna be then jump out off the wall and in front of the car, and now the driver looks at her to know left, right, left, right. Well, how does she know? 
because there's somebody behind the car, back close to the water box, uh, telling her left, right, left, right. So that allows us to get the car staged where we want. When I look at that track as a tuner, I'm looking for the continuity of the of the traction surface that I've got the, the, that I've got available there. So if you've got a bald spot because they run other types of cars that tear up the track, I I would tell Russ. I already know this before we run. If he's my driver, I tell him, look, I'm going to put you a half a tire toward the center or half a tire towards the outside. I'd rather, I don't worry about where the burnout was, I worry about where the best possible traction is. So I put the car where I want it. So that's why we're, when we're backing him up, why he can't do it himself, because I want the car where I want it, where there's the best possible traction. So he backs up, comes to a stop, clutch in, comes to a stop, gonna go back to forward gear. And now the key is, now, now there's a bunch of crew guys around the car. They're touching the car. I'm pulling the throttle stop off if I'm outside. There's guys wiping the tires. We're all around that motor and the driver can't see any of us. The key to the program is let us know you found forward gear. What I wanna see is make a move, let the clutch out a little so I can see the tire roll forward. I now know you're in forward gear and I'm not quite as nervous about being behind the car. Now there's two starting beams. There's a pre-stage beam and you're literally breaking a beam of this infrared light with the front of the tire. So you break that and the top bulb comes on and it says you are pre-stage. Once you're pre-stage now, if you're racing someone, this is not a rule, but it is considered to be common courtesy. It's not a rule. And the courtesy is you wait till the other driver turns on their top bulb, that they are pre-staged. It's not normal for you to go on in and turn the bottom light on too. Uh, once the bottom light's on, if the other guy has staged, he's got seven seconds to bring the bottom bulb on to, to roll in to trip that second beam or it throws a red light to him. Now it's time to stage the car. And here's what you do. Number one, you make darn sure your competitor has committed. You do not want to be staged for an inordinately long period of time because it's going to start putting heat in the clutch. So how do I tell? If it's a blown alcohol car, I hear them going, wop, 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 and they'll bring their motor up. They're committed. If it's an A fuel car like this, I can hear them doing what I'm about to do, which is when I'm ready, I'm going to high side it, 100% of the fuel, and very quickly, very quickly thereafter, with a handful of brake, I'm gonna let my foot off the clutch. Now it's time to roll in, we're off, we're high-sided. So what do I do? We don't touch the throttle. All we do to, to stage this thing is to let off on the brake, a little bit, and because that centrifugal clutch is pulling. So it'll roll the car forward and watch it real close for that bottom bulb to come on. Now the car is staged. Um, so both lights are on, the opponent's both lights are on, and it's already high-sided, my foot's here pushing back, and now all I've got is brake, um, uh, steering wheel with one hand, you drive with one hand, and throttle. In drag racing, you can either have a sportsman tree or pro tree. What does that mean? Well, the Christmas tree's got three yellow lights, a green and a red. When it's time to go on a sportsman tree, it goes yellow, 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 green. And each of those are a half second increment in between. So you've got time knowing, hello, it's coming. Not on a pro tree. A pro tree, all three of those yellow lights uh, light up at one time and four tenths of a second later it goes green. So I tell you, as soon as you see yellow, you mash that throttle as hard as you can and shove that brake forward and hang on to it. If you wait till you see green, you are way late. You're trying to cut it as close to that four tenths of a second as you possibly can. But when we were up in Seattle last year against uh, a, an incredibly competitive car, Russ had an 022 light. What does that mean? 22 hundredths of a second past that four tenths is when he left. That's a really good light. So an average light is going to be 500, 600, 700, 900. You don't want anything that starts with a one. So now you've mashed the throttle, the brake you've let go of, you've got your steering wheel with your left hand, but you do not let go of the brake. Why? Because once the car gets out there a little ways, if it, if it doesn't smoke the tires and accelerates, it's going to go from zero to 80 miles an hour in one second. The next increment is where we're at greatest risk for shaking the tire. What that means is we've got enough horsepower where it's trying to, to break the tire free of the traction, but not quite enough to just spin them uh, completely. Now, you gotta learn as a driver, quiver's okay. Quiver means, forgive me here, 
I'm sorry, but quiver means it's hauling ass. That's good. The back end will sashay over and it quivers, and you know, it's running, it's running, it's running, it's running good. Quiver, you can still see where you're going. Quiver, you know that it's running good. Shake, a whole different deal. You don't even know what lane you're in. It shakes so hard. I've broken blood vessels in my eye. People have broken their teeth. It'll break the chassis in half. I split the rear wing in half one time on this car. Shake is violent. At that point, you've broke traction. You are not accelerating anymore. And you've only got a couple of options. One is to lift off the throttle and, and then stab it again, called pedaling. Or the other option is leave the throttle down and pull the brake stab the brake. Why? You're trying to get the tire speed back down to, to where it will stick. If it's shaking and your hand's on the wheel and you gotta go look, look for the, the brake, it'll be flopping around. You'll never find it. But if it's a smooth run, which it should be, then you're thundering on down, three and a half seconds, you're at 226 miles an hour at half track, and about then, you can take your hand off the brake, put your hand on the wheel, and now there's a button in the center of the wheel that's the parachutes. You do not pull the brake at 270 miles an hour. That's not my program anyway. These are the levers for the chutes right here. So I can hit them manually and push them forward, that works, or I put a button in the middle of the steering wheel here that's a pneumatic release. Hit the button, levers come forward, and now the chutes come out. Now it should be going close to 270. Those parachutes hit and they hit hard. Now keep in mind, you've been seat belted in on this seven point restraint system so hard it's sucking the air out of your lungs and you feel like you're glued to the seat. Once those chutes hit, they'll scrub 100 miles an hour off in one second and you're now suspended on those belts. So once the car starts slowing down, then you use the brake for the last part. Now would the brake stop the car? It will. So at that point, it's all over with the shouting. So now the driver turns the computer off, turns the power off to the, to the electronics in the car. So the crew is gonna come flying down there in the tow rig, and they're either gonna be um, silent, which means you didn't do very well, or you're hoping to hear the horn honking. If you hear the horn honking, you know you either won that round or you turned on a really good ET. A 520 is a really good ET for us. So if you hear the horn honking, it's a good day. And the driver gets out then and turns off the air bottle back there and turns power off and waits for the crew to come get him. So the steering wheel's uh, mandatory. It's got to have a quick release to take off. So if anything bad happens and the uh, safety folks have to haul you out of here, then they've got to get this out of the way quickly. So there's a quick release on the steering wheel. That comes off. Steering wheel now goes out of the way and it makes it easier to get you out of the car. The other thing that's a part of getting out of the car are these. These are called get-out bars, believe it or not. They're there for a reason, to help get your fat behind, my fat behind out of the car. So you, you do that by putting your arms there and pulling yourself out. Getting in is the easy part, getting out is the hard part. So that's a basic overview of how a run works mechanically on the car, what the driver does, what the guy that starts a car does. That's a basic overview. It's probably more detailed than, than I've heard most described. But if I was you, I'd want to know a little bit, if, and it was, was interested in this stuff, I'd want to know how it worked, and that's how it worked. So if you like something, let us know. If you don't like something, that's okay too. Just let us know. We want to make good content for you. Thanks for being a part of this deal today.